Welcome to a Super Bowl bonus episode of A Life in Film. I'm Elliot James Langridge, I'm an actor, writer and apparently a podcaster, and I love film. This is the podcast that we ask our guests from in front and behind the camera, how did they get their foot in the door? What was the key to unlocking their success? What's their story? Previous guests include Toby Jones, Antonia Thomas, Amanda Abington and Andrea Riseborough. Today's guest, Kevin Misha, worked his way up from the mailroom to creative executive at TriStar Pictures. He oversaw numerous productions including Donnie Brasco starring Al Pacino and Johnny Depp and sports classic Rudy. He moved to Universal where he soon became president of production at the age of 33, supervising production on movies such as Aaron Brockovich, The Mummy, Meet the Parents, The Fast and Furious and The Born Identity. He then created his own production company, Misha Films. First on the slate was Scorpion King, then The Rundown, The Interpreter, Public Enemies, and more recently producing the brilliant Fighting With My Family and bringing Eddie Murphy back to our screens with Coming to America and Netflix's You People. We chat about his journey to success, how to land your script on his desk, and his most embarrassing moment, which involved him getting held up at gunpoint. In celebration of the Super Bowl this weekend, Kevin's latest project, American Football, is a new eight-episode series that explores the rough and tumble origins of America's most popular sport. It's a life and fail. 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 I'm Michael Strahan. For a decade and a half, I was the defensive end for the New York Giants. This is a story centered in the very beating heart of the American dream, with hard scrabble characters whose visions and ambitions were as large as the country that created them. This is one of the greatest football stories ever told, because without it, there is no New York Giants, no Super Bowl, no Pro Football Hall of Fame. This is the unbelievable true story of the rough and tumble origins of the National Football League. The first chapter of this story begins in Canton, Ohio, where pro football was born and where pro football almost died. And to tell you how it all happened is my friend Kate Mara, who as the daughter of not one, but two historic football families, knows a thing or two about the legacy of the game. Welcome to American Football. Nice to meet you, Elliot. I have to, I'm gonna admit straight off the bat, I'm from London. I know nothing about American football, but I listen to the podcast and I've now sucked in like my mates into it. So like, we're going to watch a couple of games together. Uh, the Super Bowl like is obviously it. coming up and um, I'm going to get involved this year round. So I want to ask um, before we actually get into talking about the podcast and, and how that came about um, just to sort of warm up and like, you know, kind of get get into the spirit. Can I ask you a couple of quick fire questions? Okay, is this great. like speed round? Oh, speed round. So whatever comes to your mind, like the, the first thing that comes to your mind and then we'll okay. go and then we'll go straight into talking about the podcast. All right, go ahead. Straight off the Let's bat. Let's do it. Right. What are you most scared of? I'm going to start with the easy ones. <laughs> Snakes. Snakes. Signature dish. Signature dish? Yeah. Like when, when you cook something, what's something you go to and you're like, I could do that. Hands time behind mm, my back. Probably pasta. Probably, I'd say pasta dish. First film you ever saw? That's a good one. I would say, well, let me say this. First, most impactful film was The Great Escape. Um, yeah, what a movie. And I saw it on uh, this thing. We had this thing in New York. I grew up in New York. And it was this uh, movie of the week, which was at 4.30. It was like the 4.30 movie. And it was so long that they had to chop it up, you know, with the commercial breaks. But they had to chop it up. So it was one of those things that you sort of, it was like three days of, I guess, you know, it was like appointment television for me back then, right? It was like you had to show up. So it was sort of like following the, uh, you know, the great escape that, yeah, I think that would be the most influential. And like, in my head, that was sort of, I'm sure there were other movies that I saw. And I could tell you like the first movie I saw, first R-rated movie. I I could do that. Then Blazing Saddles, by the way, was the first R-rated movie I ever saw. Um, These were great films. Yeah. Um, so uh, my dad was 
you know, sort of sheepishly took me there and did, we didn't tell we didn't tell my mom. And then um, Harold and Maude was right after. It was a double feature. And Harold and Maude, I remember, followed Blazing Saddles. And that the, the scene opened with a, you know, with a, a hanging, a fake hanging, right? And um, my dad was like, we got to get out of here. I just, that I remember, you know, so there's, there's moments in like that, that, that. But The Great Escape was, I think, the movie that sort of, if I said why I'm here, it's sort of that's the movie that first moved me in a way that I was like, what do those people do? How does that happen? You know. Yeah, yeah. So it was actually like an initiation almost. That's something that when you went, hang on a minute, I'd like to be involved with making these things. I don't know if I don't know if I was as cogent as that at that time. I think it was just sort of like, well, this is awesome. I feel like I want to go get on a motorcycle and go race down a road really fast like Steve McQueen. How does that, you know, how do you do that? You know, it felt like it was, uh, you know, it was like a gateway drug to a world and worlds that I didn't know. Um, So I'm sure there were movies, I'm sure there were movies before that, Mm -mm. right? And I, you know, I was a kid who always was like, I love, you know, I loved every movie. Every movie was a 10 or an 11, right? Um, So, uh, yeah, but I think that was the one I would say sort of did that for me. The Great Escape is a funny one because I remember watching it very young as well and and just watching it in kind of even at, at a young age realizing that Steve McQueen was he was really doing those things on the motorbike and watching it just being like wow that's that's amazing and I mean a lot of films now obviously use a lot of CGI but he was genuinely doing those things on that motorbike and it's just it's kind of a, it's a I mean it's a crazy milestone in in film history that um but he was one yeah. of those guys that did a lot yeah, of his own stunts, wasn't he? And, and and with like you know the racing the cars and everything else. Tom Cruise of his generation. He was Tom yeah. Cruise I mean, is the Steve McQueen of our generation, right? Tom Cruise is still you know he's he's not an old man, but he's he's a guy that's been in the industry a long time, and he's still doing these insane stunts. And you just think, yeah, it's incredible. And he's always up in the ante. It almost I'm sure it worries a lot of people, but I'm watching it thinking. What is he? What is he going to do next? Because each time it just gets more and more obscene. Uh, I mean, have you seen? Have you seen? Obviously, the stunt that he's done for the new one where he goes off. I did. On the I motorbike. Saw, yeah, I saw that online. Yeah, yeah, pretty extraordinary. I mean, he's a he's a madman. He's one of the last kind of proper movie stars. Um, you know, a guy from he's almost from a from another era. Um, there's very few actors that can command that kind of that kind of attention it's um it's impressive to have a career that long i think industry. also with i think also with a few of the you know there's a few of those guys who've just been around at a certain level for so long that you see that when they're on set or and i've never i've never worked with tom but um but like julia roberts and eddie murphy who i've just worked with a few times it's like you could see the sort of respect deference mm-hmm. just like aura that these people have for their art and their presence that are, you know, sort of um, impactful in a way where you feel like the sound wave as they move through the mm. the, the space that you're in. He's um, Eddie Murphy's a, I'm a big fan of Eddie Murphy. And when I saw the trailer for your new movie, You People, I was so excited. That combination of him being in a, you know, a comedy that's going to be on Netflix, but also just that kind of comedy and seeing him come back to kind of, you know, playing, I, I just love seeing Eddie Murphy being an asshole in movies. <laughs> number number one on Netflix. Number yeah. one on Netflix. Yeah, right number now. one on Netflix. I mean, it's just come out here and we watched it last night. So I'm like, you know, it's fresh in my mind. So you want to marry my daughter? Yes. Yes, I do. So do you hang out in the hood all the time or do you just come up here for our food and women? It's a valid question. It is. What's the difference between me and you? If Amir and I had a baby, it would be a very nice baby. Mixed race people are really awesome. You know, you have like Mariah and Derek Jeter, and then of course you have the, the goat. The goat? The greatest of all time. Yeah, I know what it means, but who are you referring to? Our guy, the legend, Malcolm X. What in the mother? What's the difference between me and you? And she's not pregnant because we don't even do that much stuff she, she's not a prude she knows her way around it and that's okay. that and i respect I, and then what i'm saying is i love your daughter and i would make a good husband ain't this about my bitch what's the difference between me and you 
your new project, which is um, the American Football Podcast. Pretty self-explanatory yes. in the title, what it's about. Um, but in your own words, um, how would you ex- how would you uh, describe this podcast? I think what we came upon was the idea that the both the game of football and the 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 prime league that you watch professional football um through uh, the National Football League that has an origin story. Both have an origin story, and that the origin story is actually a fairly compelling one, particularly for for today because football, American football, I know football over there is a as a different is a diff, different um, reference point. But American football, um, after it was um, created in the mostly at the universities in the United States, um, that there was a period of time sort of post Spanish Civil War over here. So sort of, you know, late 18, very late 1800s, early 1900s, when the game started to become popular, the game itself started to become popular in the elite universities of this country. And actually every university back then was pretty much elite, right? And it catered to the elite. Um, and that there was a feeling amongst the um, the uh, the upper class of America that with no more war to test young men's mettle, that football, the game of American football, was going to be the way that we tested the character of young men at the elite universities of the time. And so it got very, very popular, became a nationwide sport, um, college football, college American fo- American college football. And then um, in uh, Western, I was, my directions always get screwy, Western Pennsylvania and Eastern Ohio, um, uh, immigrants, Native Americans, African Americans, and, you know, uh, largely factory workers and the working class largely wanted to play the game, but they didn't have access to the game. So they started to play on the weekends by themselves through their clubs or the, you know, their, their work team versus a beer hall, whatever, mm-hmm. whatever those, the, the format those took. And some entrepreneurs suddenly started to realize if they could put a rope around it and charge admission, they could actually make money with people watching this game that people were playing for fun because they couldn't access the game the way the elite were. So that it was a very, the reason it's in a very American sport, and that's sort of why we called it American football. Um, it's a uniquely American characteristic that it has this can do origin where, hey, they're not going to let us play. So we're going to do it anyway. And then it builds itself up into, frankly, you know, and this is part of the premise of the of the show, is that it's the engine through which the American industrial entertainment complex was built because everything comes out of that. Um, there's stars, as, as, if you've listened to it, right? The, the Red Grange, a, a, a huge football star becomes a movie star. Um, radio is built around football later and we'll get into that hopefully in later seasons television becomes a prime mover of the game of football and vice versa and obviously right now um, the game of professional football college football too but football is the is one of the top I, I saw some stat the other day that out of the top 100 television shows of the last year 80 I think it was 82 were uh, professional football games Wow, that's insane. Yeah, that's insane. Yeah. And I mean, obviously talking to you about this and, and the fact that you've you've gone into this project and you produced it and, and everything else, you obviously had a, an interest in American football and a fascination for it. But what was the how, how did this come about? How how did you get involved? We had, you know, years and years ago, I was uh I used to run Universal Pictures. Um I was president of production. And um, we had been developing a project called Leatherheads there. Um, years ago, it became um, George Clooney, um, Steven Soderbergh produced it. And, and uh, it was a, it, the project that we were developing was very different than that. We were sort of doing a much grittier, tougher, um, uh, real interpretation of the story, not as comedic as, as those folks did. And um, it always sort of, I was always fascinated by the story that I just told you, or this origin story. And years and years later, um, we st- myself and um, uh, Andy Berman, who is a partner of mine, we started to look at um, 
the stories as other formats because we're primarily movie people. Um, I grew up a, 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 as a film lover, and I you know have, have professionally lived mostly in the in the feature film space. But as other forms of um, of the media landscape started to rise in popularity and garnered my interest, I think we realized there was another perhaps another way to tell the story. We t tried to do it as a scripted drama for a little bit. Um, uh, you know, sort of, I would call it the crown of football, if you think about it that way. Um, and, uh, but the the economics um, at the time weren't working. So um, we partnered with uh, Michael Strahan, uh, Hall of Famer, and his partner, Constance Schwartz Marini, um, and uh, who I'd known for a while for her time at the NFL. And we basically started to talk about how we could do it as a podcast because we thought that would be a, a very simple um, way of articulating this story, which we had spent, frankly, years researching. Um, and one of the things that was exciting is all through this time, what we started to realize as we figured out the the, the architecture of the story, the beginning, middle, and end, um, you know, the origin of the league, the building of the league on the backs of some some really great men, known and unknown, and then this final game where this rival league was knocked away and the NFL sort of stand, stood supreme, we realized that story hadn't been written anywhere. Um, and and the podcast just seemed like a very sort of straightforward and simple way to do it. And Michael Strahan helped us get um, on Audible to launch this um, with A&E Studio support. So it was actually a great opportunity to get this story out in a very fast and speedy way um, once we knew um, exactly what the story was. Now for a quick break. Are you a writer, director, actor, costume designer, perhaps makeup artist? Are you interested in camera? This is the place to share your journey. We want to hear from you. How did you start your career? Has it started yet? And perhaps if you're feeling brave, share with us your most embarrassing film related moment. So slip into our DMs at Life in Film Pod on Instagram. Check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash life in film where you'll get episodes early and uncut amongst other treats. And don't forget to follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you enjoy this episode, please leave us a positive rating. Add us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok at Life in Film Pod and find our video episodes on YouTube by searching Elliot James Language Life in Film. Essentially, please like and subscribe everything. It makes a huge difference. Thank you. This is also a space we'd like to fill with sponsors and advertisement for like-minded podcasts. So please get in touch. And back to the show. This really is like, a, you know, from the very start. And, and that's helpful for me because, as I say, like, I, I, I know nothing about American football. And I feel like I've learned, you know, listening to this, I'm, I'm now invested in it, I'm interested in it. And I'm sure that's one of the aims of the podcast, not just to, you know, put it out to people that are really into the sport, but also, you know, bring in perhaps a new audience um, that's going to get invested in and interested in it as well. But you you worked on, um, uh, early on in your career, you worked on a movie called Rudy. Yeah. Which, yeah. That, did, did, was there any kind of crossover there in terms of like, did you learn anything from working on that that you brought onto this? I mean, it's obviously a very different platform, but um, it, it just kind of struck me that that was one of your sort of first projects. And now this is where we are now and you're working yeah. on this. Well, I mean, listen, I think there's part of it um, that there's, there's aspects of the American football story which have sort of the spirit of Rudy, right? You know, sort of the football as the the purveyor or the mechanism through which the American dream can be realized. And I think, you know, for that, I, I think it, there's a similarity to it. You know, I, it's funny because in terms of, I would say Rudy, as well as American football, the parallels of that, I, they're, they're obviously about, football is very, Pr, pr, uh, football operates in that it has a lot of prime real estate in these stories, but I don't think they're essentially about football exclusively, right? I think they are, like, I would hope that American football um, is very appealing to the non-fan. Listen, obviously, the, the foot, it's for the football fan, right? Like, you're, you know George Hallis, you know the Bears, you're like, ooh, that's how the Bears were founded. Right. Ooh, uh, Fritz Pollard. Ooh, I had heard that name, but I didn't know who he was. So interesting to me that he was one of the first African American players and the very first champion of the first year of the National Football League. 
Um, and you've heard of Red Grange as this famous player, you know, epic runner who broke records in both in games and through seasons. You knew all these things. Um, but what you but what I think is so fascinating to me is sort of the layout of it at this prime point in American history when we went from an isolationist country to a superpower and watching football both grow and influence the character of the nation. So, and and I find that where we are today, there's a great reflector to that. And that's actually why we wanted, one of the things I neglected to say when I was talking about the, the urge to get it out quickly is, I felt like there was a great deal of relevance to what we're going through today um, in sort of classicism and the divides in our society over here and perhaps the world. And that football holds a mirror to our essential selves as Americans. And that it was a, the, the origin of it has the same story. And I think one of the reasons why football sticks so much to the American character is that over and over, every, every section, and we've looked at sort of the next 30, you know, the next 30 to 40 years, the stories, the same stories repeat themselves, right? And even today, you could find storylines that were happening this season that go right back to, I mean, George Hallis is the Bill Belichick of his time, right? And so there are characters, real people, but characters in storytelling, right? That that are both contemporary, even though they have, um, you know, they lived, you know, they're no longer with us and they lived back in the teens and 20s. It was very important for us to add the contemporary voices that we did to all the Hall of Famers that we got to speak. It was very important for us to add those voices, both to tell their own personal stories of today and also sometimes reflect on what it must have been like back in the day, because we I didn't want the history to seem very sepia tone, which is what I was mostly worried about when you tell a history story is that it only appeals to the hardcore football fan or the hardcore history fan. And it, I thought this is just a great yarn, right? And that in order to make sure that people today would listen to it that I wanted it to have a, a cinematic feel. We hired a great young composer to do the music. Um, we reinterpreted some classic songs back in period garb, as it were. And then we used a lot of contemporary voices, Peyton Manning, Eli, Eli Manning, Aaron Rodgers, um, Bill, Bell, um, uh, uh, Bill Cower, contemporary coaches, players, executives, Roger Goodell is in it. All these people talking about their experience today to understand that what those guys was going through, what those guys were going through back in the day, isn't so different than what everybody deals with today. So that was very important to to me, so that both the 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 show and what it was about had had relevance if people listened to it. It didn't just feel like something about some distant bygone time. And when you, well, I mean, you say that it's, it, I, I did really feel that when I was listening to it, that it, it has a very cinematic feel. Um, it feels like you, you know, you're watching a movie. How how do you, when you start from the very beginning of you know getting something like this off the ground from the from the start, you know, you I guess you don't know if you're going to get these Hall of Famers, you're going to get all these people involved, you know, uh, getting Kate Mara and, and people like that. How does that all come together? And um, what is the first, what is the process there? What what comes first? Well, I think we knew the story. That was the most important thing. And, and you know, we weren't we weren't um, getting the rights to a book or adapting something from another medium. We were it, it's a story that exists in history and all these disparate elements and disparate people came together. So I think, as I was saying, myself and Andy Berman, who I work with, he did quite a bit of research and sort of collating the story. And I think we basically sort of laid it out and realized that there was, as I said, this beginning, middle and end. Once we had that story, and frankly, when we got Michael Strahan on, um, I mean, I think his status, both as a as a as an iconic um, performer, both on and off the field, helped us in 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 ways that was immeasurable, right? Um, Kate Mara, because he's a giant. Kate Mara is a is a leg is a is a is a daughter of the Giants and 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 the Steelers. But um, in this, in for our story, the Giants were very relevant. So he um, had a relationship with her and asked her if she would want to tell the tale, right? And and obviously it's sort of cool that she's talking about, you know, if you know or don't know, you do know once you get through the story, she's talking about a relative of hers 
in real time, which is sort of exciting. And it was exciting which to I listen to for the first. No idea about as well. So listening to that was like, oh right, that's that's completely yeah. um, you know off the wall kind of uh, information that I was not expecting. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a nice it's a nice little treat in the middle of it that suddenly it turns personal, right? That. Mm. Um, but the but the thing is, I mean, Michael was able to Michael and Constance, who had a long his, who has a, both of whom have a long history with the NFL, were able to um, through their relationships and the trust in in, in the fact that we were going to tell a very truthful story um, and be honest about it. Um, that got all these players to come to come join us. So knowing what the story was, being able to pitch the story and tell everybody what the story was, and 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 the participants who, you know, slowly but surely from Michael and Constance on forward were involved, I think there was a great faith that we were going to tell the story right, that we were going to do it with a great deal of integrity. And and we love the story. And I think that sort of became a rock rolling downhill. And at some point we started to say, oh my God, we have so many voices, how are we going to fit them all in? So that was sort of exciting too. But I, I think, it, you know, for me, and I, it sounds like for you and I, it seems like for, for everybody who's listening, it, it accrues to, to what we wanted it to be is sort of this, you know, a story that takes a lot of twists and turns that you don't expect that it builds pace and as exciting as it goes. And there's these great, uh, you know, one of the things I'm so proud of is we've got all these great sportscasters of today to call out games of the path and actually do a play by play of games of the past, which gives it this sort of, you know, mm -hmm. versimilitude for today, which is sort of fun. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I just wanted it to be something that would uh, listen. I never done a podcast. I didn't know anything about doing a podcast. I, it was completely confusing to me at the beginning, right? And um, what was sort of fun, I was just sort of like, follow, I was just follow your nose. Like, if we like it, let's just try and do it and see if it works. And we had some really experienced um, uh, podcast uh, writers and producers on who worked with us, who were really, really terrific in terms of um, telling us when we were going to hit a third rail, frankly. Um, and and uh, and 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 go off the rails, um, and it was sort of fun and exciting and intoxicating because every day we were sort of racing to the finish line to get it done. It was sort of like a two minute drill in football <laughs> at every moment, extra time in 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 your football. And um, I, I have to ask, um, with it, I mean, you've been in the industry a long time, and and you've done some incredible movies. A man of great taste, um, I would personally say, but how? How did you become interested in, you know, producing and and obviously you say that watching films like The Great Escape was something that kind of, you know, it got your attention. But how what what was that initial actual, you know, entry into into the film industry? Well, I think well, what I did was after college, like everybody, <clears throat> just trying to figure out what I was going to do. I went to business school, um, undergraduate, and um, I didn't really know what I was going to do other than I knew that I, I didn't want to do, I didn't want to do sort of, I want, I don't even know what I didn't want. I, di I didn't know what I did or didn't want to do. I just wanted to try and be in movies. That's what I knew. And I didn't have any real connections or didn't really know anybody. And so I, um, I wound up getting a job in finance at HBO in New York, where I was. Um, I went to school in Philadelphia and then I um, went back home to New York and I was able to get a job <clears throat> in finance. And while I was in finance in New York um, uh, at HBO and I was just doing budgets, uh, department budgets, not like movie budgets or anything like that. I was literally doing sort of, you know, the macro, this department budget, annual budget, um, quarterly differentials and all that. And then what happened was I started to, uh, I asked somebody if I, if how I would get onto the creative side and there was a there was a couple of people there who directed me over to to people who ran the story department. So I was re so that would be you would be reading scripts and doing um, a synopsis on a script and a commentary on whether the script, if it was a writing sample, if you thought the writer was any good, and if it was an available script for purchase, if you thought HBO should acquire that material. That was basically what you do as a script reader. And so I would do, I did that freelance at the same time I had, so I had my finance job during the day and then I would be assigned a script to read at night. And that was wow. sort of my day as a 20, whatever year old, 22 or 23 year old. And I was sort of like, oh, I like the, I like what I do at night much better than what I do during the day. Although, you know, little did I know it was sort of 
accumulating all the uh, experience that that I would need together as a building point, as a starting point. And so when I just when when I start was doing that for a year, I, I just started asking people, okay, now what? What do I do? And then everybody said, move, you know, move out to LA. And and uh, for me, given my business background and a very very limited creative understanding, people said start in the mailroom. You know, a very traditional Hollywood path that you've probably heard about for you know hundred years. People have been doing it a hundred years. So I went into a I got a, I was able fortunate. You know, uh, one guy answered a a letter from mine. You know, who, somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody, and there was an opening in the mailroom. And mailroom is not a euphemism for anything other than you are a, you work in the mailroom. You deliver mail and you you know Xerox and you know back then it was much less digital and technological. You were you know running you were running messengers messengers you were messengering scripts to people's mm -hmm. houses, which was sort of awesome. Where you know your LA is this Byzantine city, um, uh, you know collection of suburbs with streets that don't make sense. It's not like a, there's no grid at all. And, uh, you know, to get in like your little, your little car that you, you know, coming from New York, it's, I, I wasn't a big driver previously. I come out here and it's like, here, go deliver this to the Hollywood Hills. And they used to have, they used to have this thing called the time. There was no GPS. There was no, you know, ways or anything. They used to have this, this thing called the Thomas guide where you had a map and then it ended on one page. And you had to turn 15 pages to find where the connection was. I mean, it was, it was quite hairy. And they're like, here, go deliver the script to, um, you know, Shelly Duvall or whomever, right? Shelly Winters or, you know, Red Buttons or, you know, whoever the, you know, the old greats were. And they're like, just go. And, and you know, you learn your way. And that's how it all, for me, that's how it all began. And I worked in agency for a while until I got, I was fortunate enough to get a job um, as a young executive at, um, at TriStar Pictures for Mike Menavoy. Wow. And then, I mean, from there, the list of films that you've done speak for themselves. And I mean, going from, you know, the mail room to then, you know, getting involved film with films like Donnie Brasco, Fast and Furious, and then, you know, The Mummy and, and all these like big, huge Hollywood movies. That doesn't happen overnight. I mean, that's like, that's a, you know, a long period of time and a lot of hard work. But now that you're, you know, you've been in the in the I don't want to say how many years you've been in the game, but you know, you've you've been there for a while. Yeah. And... <laughs> what what advice would you give to, you know, young script writers or producers, people trying to get their either their foot in the door or or you know, trying to get their script read? Um, what advice would you give to them and, and maybe your younger self if you could go back and, and say, you know, this will make it easier? Well, I honestly, I, I think I've done it the way I, I don't have, I try not to live in a world of, of regret professionally anyway. Um, uh, and I think, I don't know that I would have done it entirely differently. I, if I was going to say one thing to my younger self about how to do it is I would be, I would push myself to have been bolder even. That would be the advice. Be bold in your choices and 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 by that I mean follow what you love and don't be afraid that oh I'm pushing a little too far. I think you know the 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 for me for me moving to LA and not going to become a lawyer or a, a business executive of some sort and pursuing this was a huge leap for me as a young man. It was just a tremendous leap. You know, back I, again back then talk about it. I'm old enough. It is true. Back then, L.A. and New York felt rather much further away than they do today, you know, with all the all the technologic tech, technology and, you know, sort of the fluidity with which you can now hop, feel like you can hop on an airplane and, and zip back and forth. So it felt like a big move. And it was that. But so I would say is that had I been even a little bolder, I might have experimented with not following a more traditional the, the traditional path out here that I even followed. So. That's what I would say. But in terms of sort of general advice, I would say, you know, to young anything, I would say do what you love. I, it sounds so trite, but um, I was describing it to one of my one of my oldest friends happened to be out visiting. He's not in the in the entertainment business at all. And I was talking about coming to the office and I was talking about how much I'd enjoy coming to the office and sitting around and talking about story ideas and, you know, talking about which actors to go send this script to or which directors might want to do it. And 
the four, you know, three movies and two television shows and one documentary I was watching this weekend and some ideas that I got from one thing to get to the other. And today it was like how this chat GPT is going to affect our storytelling. And if you use it and there's a great idea there, can you use that? Or is that just an AI generated bull? Like, again, like the, it runs the gamut, right? And and for me, and still, is I just, I love that. That's mm. just, it's super enjoyable for me, right? And then I watching the, the, you know, the, yeah, I'm watching the, you know, and, and either watching or listening to the fruits of your labor, you know, Eddie Murphy is on set and he and Jonah Hill are doing it and Kenya Barris is directing it and you've had a significant part in assembling all of those people mm. or even with this podcast, you know, knowing that people are listening to it and the, there are there are little sound choices in it that, you know, we've made to make your experience better. Like that's, I mean, that's why I made the big leap to come out to LA in the first place. So again, I would just, it's and, and it's hard and I can spend a whole half hour being cynical to you about how difficult it all is and how even more difficult today it probably is than back in the day. Mm. And the only thing that's going to get anybody through is love. You know, that you that you love it no matter what and that there's you yeah. feel like there's nothing else you can do um, than this, because if you didn't do this, you wouldn't be able to get up in the morning. So mm -hmm. that's what I would again, it's all you've heard it before, but I, I would I would echo what everybody has said about it. Like, make sure you love it. And make sure when the ship goes south that you're that you love it enough that you're willing to stick it out through some, you know, some rough stuff. Mm. Honestly, though, that's that's what you know. My audience is what I want to hear. That is inspiring to hear the the passion you know you have for your job, and that's why we all you know we all strive to be in the film industry. If that's what we love, we, you know, you just got to go for it, hundred percent. Um, I've I've got to wrap things up now, but this is this has been wicked, I'd, and I'd I'd love to ask just two more questions if we have the time. Um, one's a bit stupid. One hopefully is a little bit more useful <laughs> for the audience. But um, first question would be. Your production company, Misha Films, you know, for example, if let's say someone has a script and they, they're wanting to get it, you know, made, they haven't got a name, they're not like, you know, a known writer, but they want to get it on your desk. What what can people do to kind of contact your production company if they think they have a script that you you guys might be interested in? Right. That's hard, honestly, um, you know, because unsolicited material we can't take legally. I mean, that's just the sort of the difficulty of, of the system provides it. But here's what I would say, and, and is that there are enough people in this system looking, all we do all day is look for great ideas, right? All day, every day, there are, there are young to old people looking for great new ideas. And if you have something, you know, seek out representation, Get a, get a lawyer who can help you so that, you know, uh, somebody who has a relationship with somebody, somebody who feels protected by that relationship um, legally. Um, but again, my, my sort of, it's not my advice, but it's my, um, it's my, uh, it, it's my belief that somebody's going to find you if, if it's good. Right. And again, you may have to, that may have, you may have to open a lot of doors and it may take some time. But there, there are a lot of people out there looking um, for it. It's difficult to call me or email or even leave like an email on, you know, our vo you know, company voicemail and to get anything back in terms of material. We just, we can't do that. Sure, sure. So it's I all will say about this, getting it's, representation. I think representation or at least an attorney who has some relationship to get, to get something read. Let me say one other thing, and this is, I'll be cynical for a moment, is that the difficulty today is that everybody's looking for IP is the hard part. And that, um, you know, the uh, finding, getting a screenplay read and then acquired and then made, that's a little bit of a difficult journey. But things like the blacklist and, you know, all of those lists that have now developed and all of the, the internet access that provides, people are looking at those and they provide a liquidity between the young writer or the young artist and the business professional that allows that to be a little bit less um, biased and more open and more open universe in terms of how everybody's able to access um, unrepresented material. So I would say avail yourself of those festivals, you know, those, those, those 
pitch confabs that people get together and just pitch young executives. There are ways to do it. And you just have to be, you have to be industrious. And again, if you love it, you'll be industrious. And if you're industrious and you're good, somebody's going to, you're going to connect with somebody. Awesome. Awesome. And now for the stupid question. Most embarrassing moments, yeah. I could tell you when I was incredibly embarrassed. Here, so when for the rundown, which is a Dwayne Johnson movie I love did, it. which I love, um, we went to go scout in Brazil and I had made a big deal for the director that um, we were, uh, that uh, in the director's behalf, Pete Berg directed it. And I made a big deal to Universal who I had not too, in the not too distant past, I had been the, the, the president of production at Universal and I had left to go become, start my production company and go produce. This was, I think my second movie that I, I was producing for them. So I was producing the movie, an early movie of, a, of my production company but I was producing it for now working for a lot of people that I used to work with. Right. And I made a big deal that we were to go down to Brazil to go scout locations because we should either shoot in Brazil or we should make sure that there would be a, you know, sort of, we should, it should be a look either a location scout or a, um, a research trip to make sure that we really sort of got our environment. Right. And I thought that was very critical to the movie as did Pete Berg. And so I fought in his behalf. Um, the trip was not very well organized ultimately when we got down there and we wound up um, being held up um, and, and, and at gunpoint for, for, with our production designer, our director um, and a number of other people um, and our interpreters, because we had walked into a place that hadn't been properly um, uh, organized for us. And so we were, we were, we were held. It's in, it's been written about in variety. Um, but, uh, I, I wasn't embarrassed in the moment. I was scared in that moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we got out. We got out of it fine. But the humiliating part was, I had a call again. All these people who had worked for me, who I worked with, who I had made a big deal about taking this trip, and and I thought organized very well. But there were little things that sort of you know broke down and sort of saying, oh, by the way, that trip which I thought told you was essential, we've you know we've all been you know held up for quite a while and had this, that, and the other thing taken wow. from us and. And we had a turn tail and we came back, uh, we came back within 24 hours. And I guess either happily or unhappily, we, we got all the verisimilitude of Brazil through the scouting trip for sure. And the village was shot in Los Angeles. So oh, really? there you go. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. He's come to the other side of the world. Is that duct tape? <laughs> To finish one last job. I'm looking for a man. His name's Travis Walker. Brown hair, face like a weasel. Do I know you? I'm taking you home, Travis. What's in Los Angeles? Your father. No, 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 no. Oh. 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 So angry! Shut up. If only it were that simple. Apparently, he stumbled onto a trinket of some value in my jungle. Yep. I want it back. Wow. Whatever my father is paying you, I will double it. No. I'll quadruple it. No. I'll double it and quadruple it. Hell no. I hope you enjoy the fall. Now what fall? been a real pleasure and I'm a, I'm a big fan of your work so um oh, yeah nice. thanks man thanks for taking the time i appreciate it thanks for your time take care man all the best it's a laugh and film motherfucker subscribe and like and follow it's a laugh American Football is available on Audible now, and You People is also available on Netflix now. Thank you to our guest, Kevin, and thank you as always to 42 West.